One of the most important questions that everyone eventually confronts is, who am I? And it's not a question that science or philosophy has gotten right yet. So I'm putting this video together to help you understand who are you. There's things that we can say about human beings in general and the way that human beings work that are going to help you decide this question for yourself. According to Western philosophy, we are made up of essentially two components, the mind and the body. I'm not saying this is right. I'm saying that this is one way of thinking about who we are. This is called Western dualism, and Descartes was probably the most famous progenitor of this idea that there are two components to us, the mind and the body, and that they're separate. Inside the mind, the one way of thinking about the mind is that there are three aspects. The ancient Greek philosophers uh, gave us these three, and they've been perpetuated up through the centuries. Those three are thinking, our cognition, our feeling, our emotions, and our instinctive drive to do. You might call that doing, although behavior is... A, an amalgam of the mind and the body, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put three words to these. The cognitive, the affective, and the conative. The mind is all three of these aspects, with the conative being that instinctive, instinctive drive to act. They all work together, of course, in the mind, but the the mind-body dualism of Western philosophy has always privileged the cognitive. It was Descartes who said, I think, therefore I am. He didn't say, I feel, therefore I am. He didn't say, I act, therefore I am. He said, I think, therefore I am. And he gave us this enlightenment ideal that cognition was the primary purpose of humankind and the primary aspect of the mind. But it's not. The other two are equally important. The affective has become the realm of therapists and psychology. How do you feel about that? And there's very little attention paid to the conative. So right now, you need to understand that we get a lot of attention in school from the cognitive. We get a lot of attention from the disciplines of psychotherapy and self-help about our feelings. And we have very little attention paid to who we are. This turns out to be important because our instinctive drives are not malleable. They're not plastic. They're not something that we should even pay attention to trying to change. Whereas feelings come and go, and learning take place, takes place over time, the cognitive aspect of the mind is just something that we're born with. We don't know why. We're hardwired in one way or another, and these instincts emerge. But there are tools that will help us understand them, including the Colbier, which I've talked about in other posts. So part of what we need to understand about ourselves, according to Western philosophy, is our mind and the way our mind works. The other part is our body. And there's been a lot of new research to try and explain our body. Science up until now has given us a mythology of the way the body works more than it has given us an understanding. There was a time when we used to think that DNA determined everything, as if the atoms in our DNA were the indivisible pieces of us that defined who we are and that everything else in our body was some sort of deterministic billiard ball a model of what was controlled by our DNA. It turns out that that's incorrect. DNA is not some Newtonian deterministic blueprint for our body. Around our DNA, there's something called our epigenetics. It turns out that even if our genes are immutable, the turning off the expression of those genes is something that is negotiated between the DNA inside the cell and its environment. The environment can signal the expression, but our experiences can 
somewhat permanently, or at least for a long lasting effect, impact those aspects of our DNA that are expressed or not. So around our DNA, we have this idea of epigenetics. How is our DNA expressed in our cells? What's more, we are not just our DNA and our epigenetics. Uh, it turns out that this genetic information is a small portion of what it takes to make our bodies run. Wrapped around our epigenetics is something called our microbiome. These are all the microorganisms in our intestinal gut, on our skin, even in our brains, that help us do the things that our body requires, whether that's digest food or have thoughts or communicate through our nervous system. It turns out that our microbiome is a diverse set of organisms that are essential to our bodily functions. And these are much more plastic. That's much more dynamic than our DNA or our epigenetics. They can change fast. They change at the scale of the bacterial life cycle. Wrapped around our microbiome is, of course, our relationships. I'm going to put down this word. I'm going to call it culture. But culture is, is maybe not the best word. You've probably heard this idea that you are the five people who are the average of the five people who are closest to you. And there's a lot of truth to that. The fact is that we tend to model those around us. And we have an empathetic cognitive instinct to do this, to behave in ways that uh, imitates the people whom we surround ourselves with. So I'm calling this culture is a set of beliefs, behaviors, uh, norms about how we should behave and the way that we should relate to other people. Those ideas of our interpersonal relationships that we conform ourselves to have an impact upon the way we behave, the foods we eat, what we think, how we make sense of the world. In this mind-body dualism, you are both the expression of your physical self, the molecules, the atoms, the cells that make you up, and the way that you think. Now, again, I'm, there are other ways of thinking about the mind-body dualistic uh, structure. This is the Western philosophy in which I was raised, in which I'm working. And the thing about mind-body dualism is that we thought that these were separate. It turns out that the way we think impacts our bodies. And of course, our bodies impact the way that we think. The dualism approach might be a simplification that allows us to think about one thing at a time. But our understanding of ourselves is incomplete until we come to appreciate this relationship between our thoughts and the organization of the molecules and cells that make up our body and our body and the way that helps us organize our thoughts.